Welcome to this special briefing today on the high level outcomes of the Australia United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and especially any listening to this briefing today. My name is Jennifer McKinlay, the General Manager Europe and Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner UK, Ireland and the Nordics for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. I am based at the Australian High Commission in London and I work with Australian exporters and prospective UK investors looking to expand trade and investment. The Australian UK Free Kingdom Free Trade Agreement has been signed and we expect it to enter into force in the course of 2022 once it has gone through our respective ratification processes. This period between signing and entry into force gives Australian exporters time to, to examine the agreement and prepare to take advantage of the new trading arrangements from the first day that the agreement is in force. The FTA is Australia's most comprehensive trade agreement with any country other than New Zealand. It sets the foundation for both economies to support post-COVID economic recovery and has significant outcomes for the movement of goods, services and people between both countries. We're obviously not starting from scratch in this market. The UK is Australia's fifth largest goods trading partner valued at over $21 billion in two-way trade in 2020, and Australia's third largest services trading partner with two-way trade worth nearly $10 billion last year. This FTA gives a welcome boost to an already strong trading relationship. Today, we want to give you a broad overview of the high level outcomes for Australian exporters and direct you to further DFAT and Austrade resources to help you determine how these FTA gains can help you grow or diversify in the UK market. At the end of this briefing, we will provide you with links to several resources, including the full text of the FTA and access to DFAT and Austrade information and services to help you convert these FTA gains into profitable growth for your business. DFAT and Austrade will be running a series of briefings, events, and working with peak business and industry partners over the next six months to help you understand how to take advantage of the FTA. This will include highlighting the stories of Australian exporters already in the UK market and how their experience can help you to achieve results faster. This is just the start of our implementation activities for you. This FTA is founded on historical trading and bilateral ties, but its commitments in terms of innovation and the digital environment in particular set the tone and market access conditions of a modern agreement to support our future trading and bilateral relationship. Now I would like to introduce Elizabeth Bowes, Australia's Chief Negotiator for the Australia-United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement. Elizabeth is First Assistant Secretary and Chief Negotiator, Regional Trade Agreements Division at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She's a highly experienced international negotiator and was previously Minister Counselor at the Australian Embassy in Washington, overseeing Australia's broad bilateral trade relations with the US. She also was awarded the Public Service Medal in 2021 for successfully leading and defending Australia's plain packaging tobacco legislation in World Trade Organisation dispute proceedings. Elizabeth has led negotiations on this agreement from the launch by the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham on the 17th of June 2020. Since then, several rounds of negotiations have occurred with a significant milestone achieved in June this year, with the agreement in principle agreed by our respective Prime Ministers. Earlier today, I had the chance to catch up with Elizabeth to talk about the high level outcomes of this trade agreement. Elizabeth, before we get into some of the sectoral outcomes, can you briefly outline the negotiation process with the UK and the industry consultation that has steered the agreement outcomes over the last 18 months. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that introduction, which really does lay the groundwork very well for our discussion on the high level outcomes of the Australia-United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement. 
As you mentioned, the negotiations were launched by the then Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham, on the 17th of June 2020. But prior to their launch, a lot of groundwork had been laid between our two countries, more or less immediately following the outcome of the Brexit referendum in mid-2016 with the establishment of a bilateral trade working group. Over the four years between the Brexit referendum and the launch of the negotiations, the trade working group met on a number of occasions to examine the fundamentals of our trading relationship and how those could be improved through a bilateral FTA. Now, as you mentioned, the FTA was launched in June 2020, but that launch was virtual as it took place in the early days of the current pandemic. And in fact, with very limited exceptions, all of the negotiations of this FTA from start to finish have been held virtually, which is quite an achievement considering the very challenging time differences between our two countries. Now, Minister Tian and I did go to London on a couple of occasions to engage in person with the UK negotiating team and in particular with the United Kingdom Secretary of State for International Trade, firstly Liz Truss and then her successor Anne-Marie Trevelyan. We had five virtual negotiating, negotiating rounds, but then very intensive negotiations in between those rounds. And then finally in the lead up to conclusion of the negotiations. An agreement in principle was announced by prime ministers in June, 2021. And that agreement really laid out the parameters for the entire agreement. What we have done since that time is turn that very high level agreement into very detailed legal text. And in essence, we have now a 2000 page document that fully sets out all the terms of the bilateral treaty. Now, industry engagement and consultation was a very key element of the negotiating process. As I mentioned, between 2016 and 2020, under the auspices of the Trade Working Group, but also various parliamentary inquiries into our bilateral trading relationship, we received a number of submissions from interested stakeholders about how our trading relationship could be improved through a bilateral trade agreement. We renewed a call for submissions around the time of launch last year, and I'd like to thank all of those stakeholders who did provide very helpful submissions on the particular elements of the relationship that they thought could be improved through negotiations. And indeed, in the United Kingdom, a similar public consultation process was undertaken. Now, nearly all of those consultation outcomes and submissions can be found on the DFAT website, and we're very helpful in uh, us determining our negotiating positions. Outreach will continue with stakeholders following, uh, following entry into force after signature, which we've just had of the agreement. Entry into force will take place after the usual parliamentary processes in Australia. But as Jennifer said, we hope the agreement will enter into force sometime in 2022 and we will work closely with business and other stakeholders to ensure that they can best take advantage of the opportunities that the FTA provides. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Elizabeth. And look, what a phenomenal effort. Um, if we begin by looking at Australian goods exports, under the FTA, 99% of exported Australian goods by value will be able to enter the UK tariff free. Which sectors will benefit most from this? Thanks very much, Jennifer. Yes, this is a really significant outcome. And the sector that will benefit to the greatest extent is in fact the agriculture sector. Prior to this FDA, 89% of our goods by value entered the UK duty-free, 
but there were very large barriers to agricultural trade in the United Kingdom uh, following their departure from the European Union. And so as a result of this FTA, a large number of agricultural goods that we produce and export around the world will benefit from a tariff, eventual tariff-free, quota-free treatment. So just to give an example of some of the key values, and I note that at this point in time, our goods trade or goods exports are valued at about $9.2 billion. Uh, there will be very strong outcomes for beef, sheep, meat, wine, dairy, rice, and sugar. So for example, for beef and sheep meat, all tariffs and quotas will be eliminated after 10 years with very significant duty-free transitional quotas available to our exporters upon entry into force. And that's really quite a significant outcome. Sugar tariffs will be eliminated over eight years. Dairy tariffs will be eliminated over five years and rice tariffs will be eliminated on medium and short grain rice with a permanent duty-free quota for long grain rice. And these are really significant outcomes that aren't always reflected or captured in other FTAs. There are also significant duty-free quota, transitional quota outcomes for wheat, pending elimination of tariffs after four years. And tariffs on most fruits and vegetables will be eliminated on entry into force. Also importantly, tariffs on nuts, many of the nuts that we produce will also be eliminated on entry into force, including macadamias, native to Australia, as well as almonds and other nuts. Also avocados, cherries, dried fruits, citrus fruits, and other horticultural products will benefit from similar duty-free treatment. Also, tariffs on most Australian seafood will be eliminated on entry into force, with all ta tariffs eliminated after three years. Now, this includes tariffs on fresh and frozen rock lobster and all fin fish, which are all significant Australian exports. Honey, the 16% tariff on honey will also be eliminated on entry into force of the agreement, as well tariffs on most processed foods including biscuits, breakfast cereals and pasta, as well as confectionery, food supplements and olive oil. Also importantly, the UK will eliminate its tariffs on all of our Australian origin industrial goods, except ammonia and aluminium, whose tariffs will be removed in year four. But it's not just a one-way street. The UK will also uh, enjoy significant tariff cuts with 98% of all UK goods entering Australia duty-free on entry into force, including significant UK exports such as cars and whiskey and processed foods, with all tariffs on all UK originating goods being eliminated within five years. So very significant benefits for Australian consumers as well. There is also, uh, alongside those tariff outcomes, are also procedures that support the tariff outcomes, in particular trade facilitation and customs simplification outcomes. For example, goods will be released within 48 hours of arrival at customs. There will be simplified paperwork requirements and a commitment to release shipments of perishable goods within six hours. Uh, which will help uh, our exporters as well. So it's not just about the tariffs, it's about all the procedures about exporting goods. There are also commitments on rules of origin, which mean that our rules of origin are in fact very liberal, which are further trade facilitative, and in fact uh, enable tra traders to make fair use of the reduced tariffs. And finally, I would like to point out one fairly unique outcome of this FTA. There will be a dedicated chapter on animal welfare. So Australian farmers are globally known for their high environmental protection, animal welfare and food standards. And we, as everyone knows, have a very comprehensive biosecurity regime 
to ensure the health and safety of Australian consumers, as well as to protect our unique environment. And both Australia and the United Kingdom place a very high value on animal welfare, and thus we have agreed provisions to recognise this. this Provisions. These provisions commit us to cooperating in relevant international fora on areas of mutual interest, including to promote the development of best practice in animal welfare. We will establish an animal welfare working group to provide a forum for ongoing cooperation and initiatives in this area, as well as appropriate provisions to ensure non-derogation from our respective levels of animal welfare protections for the purposes of encouraging trade and investment. We also have agreed provisions on cooperation on antimicrobial resistance. So these were both high priorities, particularly for the United Kingdom, but reflect our shared interests in both of these areas and very significant outcomes. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for outlining what is a fantastic outcome for Australia and the UK in terms of goods. If we could turn now to the topic of professional mobility, how will the mobility package in the FTA assist Australian goods and services exporters? Thanks very much, Jennifer. And yes, the mobility was actually a key theme that was uh, reflected in submissions by stakeholders in both Australia and the United Kingdom. Uh, a key priority in both our countries, partly reflecting the similarity of our systems and also our historical links, of course, and our very deep people to people links. So as a result, we have agreed commitments that will enhance the opportunities both for professionals as well as young people to live and work in each other's countries on a temporary basis. Uh, this includes commitments that will strengthen two-way trade in professional services. And this is quite significant because professional services make up about 14% of our total services exports to the United Kingdom. Uh, commitments include an establishment of a best practice framework to improve the two-way movement of professionals, including provisions to support mutual recognition of professional qualifications and a specific work program between legal peak bodies to further streamline and guarantee access for legal professionals between our two countries. Now, we also wanted to ensure that Australian professionals and service suppliers can provide services to the United Kingdom into the future on a level playing field with both UK and foreign suppliers and this includes cross-border trade and services such as online provision of services or indeed if our service suppliers want to set up in the United Kingdom. So importantly, the, visa, the FTA provides certainty on visa pathways for business people and professionals working in each other's countries. And in effect, the UK has agreed to provide Australian professionals access equivalent to that provided to EU nationals in the United Kingdom uh, for Australian professionals and business visitors such as investors, contractors, independent professionals, contractual service suppliers, installers, executives, as well as intra-corporate transferees. And there will in fact be new opportunities for mobility for up to a year for contractors and independent professionals. And that will be a key unique feature to this FTA. But as I said, this is also important for Australian employers hiring UK nationals. And we will treat UK nationals in an equivalent fashion to the treatment that we provide our best FTA partners. So this once again brings UK nationals onto a level playing field with the treatment that we provide with other FTA partners. And we'll also provide streamlined access for innovators and graduate trainees, which will also be a fairly unique feature of our FTA. We have agreed on a reciprocal basis to waive labor market testing requirements for businesses wanting to employ an Australian in the UK or vice versa. 
And this will once again ensure that UK nationals are treated equally or in an equivalent way to uh, nationals from some of our other key partner countries. And finally, the youth mobility outcomes are really important and have been a focus of these negotiations. And we have agreed with the UK to build upon the success of our existing working holiday maker backpacker visa programs. We have agreed that both uh, in both countries, those programs will be available for three years. In the United Kingdom, it was previously two years. So that's a great outcome for Aussie backpackers wanting to work in the United Kingdom for a working holiday. But we've also agreed on a reciprocal basis to lift the age limit to 35. And those changes will be introduced within two years of entry into force of the agreement. Fantastic. The FTA also has an important digital chapter Elizabeth, many of our exporters are adaptive, innovative, and continually improving their business practices to achieve greater efficiencies. This involves the use of digital transactions, e-commerce platforms, and the transferring of large amounts of data in, in the case of service exporters. How will the FTA support digital trade for a wide range of goods and service exporters? Well, the, the experience of COVID and uh, the experience of closed borders has really highlighted the importance of digital trade and uh, providing support for trade to flow through digitization and digitalization. So all of those outcomes are captured in uh, what is really a best practice FTA chapter on digital trade. So it includes very strong rules on data flows, which we know are so important for business, for cross-border uh, trade and services, and to enable our businesses to trade digitally, as well as to create a more certain and secure online environment. There are also strong provisions against requiring data localization, so requiring the setup of service centres in a particular country to store data, uh, subject to some exceptions for legitimate public policy objectives. We've also ensured that there are appropriate protections for consumers as part of these commitments. But in addition, as I've said, uh, we've noted that the need for digital practices means that we should no longer require paper-based trade and so there are provisions to recognise uh, digital trade facilitation, as well as more modern ways of doing business, such as e-payments and e-contracting. There's also provisions to support fintech or financial services, as this is a really important area, particularly for Australia, um, advancing provision of fintech services in other countries. And this includes provisions to support the delivery of such services through new technologies uh, to supply these services in each other's territories. So, uh, as I mentioned, there are also provisions looking at building online trust and also provisions against spam. So it's really quite a modern and an innovative uh, chapter that is also supported by a strategic innovation dialogue which we have set out in a separate chapter on innovation so that we're really across the um, areas that we think could best be captured in the future in terms of cooperation. And that also reflects areas of cooperation that we've reflected in the chapter on evolving issues on digital trade, including data innovation, emerging technologies and innovative enterprises, as well as collaboration on cybersecurity threats. So looking at both the um, permissive elements of digital trade, but also looking at emerging issues in the digital environment. Thank you. If we turn now to investment, Australian exporters and other Australian businesses generally need capital investment to support innovation and growth. 
How will the FTA make it easier for Australian businesses to gain access to investment capital? So uh, what we have agreed in the FTA is a very high standard chapter on investment that includes uh, both liberalisation elements as well as protections as based or as reflected in the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP. Importantly, though, it does not include an investor state dispute settlement mechanism because of our shared common legal heritage and the very strong rule of law that exists in both of our countries. But we have agreed strong mutual commitments to underpin our investment relationship through best practice rules that are designed to attract investment in both directions as we come out of the pandemic. Importantly, Australia has also agreed to raise the screening threshold for the Foreign Investment Review Board screening threshold to uh, approximately $1.2 billion for non-sensitive investments. So that means that any investment under that threshold will no longer be required to go through the FERB screening threshold, which will further facilitate the attraction of investment into Australia and the ease of doing business in Australia. Um, this will also help eliminate application costs and delays for investors. Now, I've also mentioned the mobility outcomes. There are significant outcomes to ensure that those investors that want to move on a temporary basis to each other's country for the purposes of investing or setting up a business in that country will have expanded stay uh, and conditions of stay and rights to work or invest in each other's country. So that will be a significant support for investors going forward. Yeah, what a fantastic outcome for um, foreign direct investment more generally. Um, Elizabeth, we, we touched a little bit um, earlier on financial services. Um, Australia has you know, such an innovative and expanding financial services sector, and these businesses are looking to export to continue to grow new markets. The UK is an attractive market given our common governance, similar regulatory environments, and a leading international fintech sector. We already have a bilateral arrangement in the form of the very successful fintech bridge between our two countries in, in place to support cooperation on fintech between governments, regulators and industry, which seeks to generate new business opportunities and reduce barriers to entry. What are the provisions in the, in the FTA that will help our financial service exporters do better in the UK market? Well, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. The financial services sector is, in fact, a priority in both our countries, and certainly the FinTech bridge has been highly successful in supporting Australian financial service providers. Um, this offers, this chapter, this FTA offers further potential for growth in the sector, as well as increased opportunities for exports to the UK of financial services. So there will be greater certainty for financial service suppliers around the rules that apply to them when providing services to UK clients. And, and that's one of the key features of services outcomes in FTAs is the certainty for the environment in which service suppliers can provide services. There will be greater transparency around authorization procedures that are necessary to supply financial services and improve access to the UK market. And there will also be provisions on innovative financial services to increase accessibility to the UK market for new financial services, and also for financial services delivered via new technologies or different technologies. So there's a lot of uh, synergies or complementarities with the digital trade chapter. We've also agreed a regulatory cooperation annex that will really see increasing cooperation between our respective financial services regulators, which hopefully will lead to uh, increased ease of doing business in each other's countries. We've also addressed behind the border barriers to financial services trade that should make it easier to establish back office functions 
as well as provide easier access to payment and clearing systems. Thank you, Elizabeth. Obviously, we, we don't have time um, in this briefing today to cover all the aspects of the F FTA. Line briefly the changes to artist resale rights and designs, and specifically how Australian artists and creative businesses can benefit. Absolutely, and, and this is really a highlight, also an innovative uh, feature of this FTA. So, on intellectual property, as part of the intellectual property, Australia and the United Kingdom have agreed commitments in support of our vibrant creative sectors. Now, these include high standard provisions on copyright designs and the enforcement of intellectual property rights online. But in particular, we've also agreed for Australia to make all reasonable efforts to join the UK as a member of the multilateral Hague Agreement on Industrial Designs, and that will provide new benefits and protections for designers in both countries. We've also agreed to expand reciprocity arrangements for artist resale rights, and that will increase the economic benefits for Australian artists, particularly important for our Indigenous artists who market their works in the United Kingdom. So Australian artists whose works are resold in the UK's art market, which of course is a, a very significant art market, will receive royalties based on the resale price. And this will provide new income streams for our Indigenous artists, whose works are increasingly popular in the United Kingdom. Now, there's also commitments in the FTA to support our innovation sectors, and that includes provisions on patents, trade secrets, and test data. But I would emphasize that none of the provisions will impact on the price of medicines in Australia or indeed in the United Kingdom. And uh, for example, there will not be longer periods of data protection. So there's very much a balanced outcome in the intellectual property chapter, but with some innovative features that will be of benefit to Australian designers and artists. Thanks, Elizabeth. We really appreciate your time today. I hope exporters listening today have found that this high-level briefing has been useful. Austrade is geared up to help goods and services exporters to get ready to take advantage of the FTA gains. Our focus will be on assisting Australian exporters to understand the details regarding improved market access conditions for their products and, or their services. We shall also be engaging with importers, distributors, buyers and importers here in the UK to grow their interest in Australian pr products and services. And we shall also continue to educate British investors about the opportunities in Australia. All our FTA activities can be accessed via the Austrade landing page at www.austrade.gov.au slash AUK FTA, which you can see on your screen now. That page includes links to upcoming events, information sessions and insight sessions on the UK market aimed at specific export sectors. This is your entry to relevant information on the FTA and a front door to access Austrade services. The DFAT website at www.dfat.gov.au slash AUKFTA has a range of explanatory materials on the FTA, such as fact sheets for farmers, services professionals, tech entrepreneurs and others. And DFAT's FTA portal is a useful tool to assist exporters and importers looking to explore the benefits of Australia's FTAs. And this you can find at www.ftaportal.dfat.gov.au. You can also find links to over a dozen case studies of Australian businesses who are poised to take advantage of the improved market access conditions when they enter into force. These FTA activities complement a broad suite of events and promotions that we're running here in London, including business programs to showcase Australian goods and services exporters, alongside, of course, the season of culture, which is currently running from the High Commission. 
As I mentioned, we also support some intensive sectoral initiatives. And here I'm talking about the FinTech Bridge and the Space Bridge. And we're looking to support more sector specific initiatives, including on critical minerals and clean energy, for example. Austrade is really in a unique position to help you in the UK market. We work very closely with all levels of UK policy and regulatory agencies and work as Team Australia here in market with our colleagues in the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, Foreign Affairs and Trade and Home Affairs. Please use this time before the FTA enters into force to find out if there are specific opportunities for your good or service in the UK market. Whatever your export stage is, please connect with us at Austrade to help you get ready to take full advantage of these new market access conditions. Thanks very much for your time today.